Okay, so um, we're going to talk about um, food safety for just a few minutes. Um, this is not an in-depth course like uh, SurfSafe. That uh, takes place over about three weeks. Very, very in-depth. Um, we're just going to talk about um, just, the, just a very concise overview of how you can keep preparing a, uh, a safe product for the kids and staff at your schools. So what we're going to talk about is, first of all, what makes food safe versus not being safe. Am I echoing pretty bad? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about what makes food safe as opposed to not safe. We're also going to talk about why that's important. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, just some really basic food knowledge, and we're going to talk about how to keep food safe. So first of all, what makes food unsafe? There are a number of different things. What we're going to mostly um, uh, pay attention to is the growth of pathogens in food. The biggest and baddest uh, pathogens to consider are nine times out of ten bacterial. So that is what we're going to predominantly going to focus on. Um, so what does bacteria have to need? What does bacteria need to grow? Uh, they need moisture. They need, well, not in all cases. They're actually anaerobic and facultative anaerobic bacterium that grow only in the presence of zero oxygen. Botulism, one of the biggest and baddest, is grown without a single trace of oxygen. So we need food, we need water, the proper temperature, and a specific amount of time. I'll tell you right now that every single bite of food that you eat has some sort of bacteria on it. It's in the air. It's on you. You have more bacterial cells on and in your body than your own cells. It's everywhere. The key is to eliminate the potentially hazardous bacteria. Now, you're going to consume potentially hazardous bacteria. If you allow it to reproduce and die, it starts producing toxins. That is what makes you sick. So there are two different types of food. Some are extremely vulnerable to pathogenic growth. The others are not. PCS means time or temperature controlled for safety. Long and short of it, those are potentially hazardous foods. Uh, these foods, bacteria, um, grow particularly well on. Uh, they need to adhere to strict temperature control, and uh, there are time lines in, in store. For instance, if you go and buy raw meat, and you let it sit on the counter for eight hours, and you eat it, you think you're going to be okay? No. Probably not. The reason being, you've taken that item and you are no longer controlling it with temperature by keeping it cold or cooking it, raising the temperature. Also, you've allowed it time to start growing that bacteria and allowing that bacteria to die. So, just kind of putting things in perspective of why you keep food in the refrigerator and why you cook it in the first place. So, potentially hazardous foods. Uh, Non-potentially hazardous foods, something is in place to prevent the growth of bacteria. For instance, breads are dry. They're, uh, now you can say, well, now cakes are kind of moist. Yeah, to an extent. However, they are a dried product. They're not moist enough to allow for growth. That's why you can keep bread on your counter, if not your refrigerator. Uh, beef jerky is a meat. Meats are potentially hazardous, but if you dehydrate it enough, and remove all of that uh, moisture from that piece of meat, it's no longer capable of growing bacteria. So, uh, potentially hazardous foods. Meats <coughs> include raw and cooked. Milk, cooked, 
vegetables, beans, rice, sauces, sliced melons, powdered corn leafy greens, and uh, garlic and oil mixtures. Those garlic and oil mixtures that you uh, have at the Italian restaurant that you can pour onto your uh, salads, they, uh, they create an anaerobic environment. They can actually grow botulism. So here's the picture. I'm going to make a very specific distinction about something with you. Notice that all of these uh, fruits are sliced. The meat of the fruits or vegetable has been exposed to the air, to oxygen, to a number of different um, environmental uh, hazards that it would not be exposed to had that uh, seal be kept intact. Uh, we've got raw and cooked meats, and that also includes deli meats. They are technically cooked. Um, they have to be kept cold. Raw eggs, because what does an egg become? Chicken. So in a very simple black and white uh, definition, raw eggs are raw chicken. Probably something you hadn't considered. So if you're keeping raw eggs on your top shelf at home, don't put them on the bottom of the raw chicken. OK, non-potentially hazardous foods. These include uncooked vegetables, beans, rices, um, fresh, uncut fruits and vegetables, breads, bagels, and crackers, beef jerky, as I mentioned before, crisp bacon. Bacon has emerged in, uh, in Greece, and it completely expels all water from the surface. No bacteria is able to grow on it. Bacon, I hate to say this, is actually one of the safer things you can eat. Now, not from an arterial standpoint, but um, in a pathogenic standpoint, yes. Uh, mustard, ketchup, pickles are so acidic that they won't grow bacteria. So we've got dry products, we've got intact vegetables and melons, and uh, these are considered non-potentially hazardous. So if you're looking at something uh, at work, at home, and you think, I wonder if this is potentially hazardous, right away, do you have to keep it refrigerated? Um, do you have to cook it before you eat it? Keep those things in mind when determining whether something's potentially hazardous or not. So, bacteria need a very specific temperature to allow for growth. That's why you cook your food to a certain temperature. That's why you keep it cold. Um, we're wanting to stay out of what is called the temperature danger zone. The temperature danger zone falls between 41 degrees Fahrenheit and 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, these are parameters put in place to avoid bacterial growth. Now, there are certain bacteria that you have to cook to a higher <coughs> temperature to completely kill, such as salmonella. Salmonella is extremely prevalent in fowl, or chickens, geese, turkey, things like that. That's why every one of those items has to be cooked to 165 degrees to control for a very specific type of bacteria. Thermometers. Do you guys have thermometers in your facilities? Yes. Okay, I'm not your health inspector, let's be honest. How often do you use them? Like the sun is the last Okay. Good. I'm glad that you're using them because that is the only way that you're going to account for the safety of these foods. Um, that's the only way, for, for instance, if your cooler goes out, does an alarm go off? No. I've inspected your facilities. I went to these schools. Don't have the money for them. So how do you know that your equipment's working properly, that you're keeping your food at the appropriate temperature? You've got to use a thermometer. How do you know that you didn't have a power surge and the oven shut down halfway through a cycle? and you know that that food's fully cooked, you've got to use thermometers. Use them often and calibrate them. If you stick it into a glass of ice water, it should read 32 degrees. Um, these stem thermometers are very, very inexpensive. 
very easy to calibrate. So we also established that bacteria need temperature for, for growth. So we've got to keep things below a certain temperature while we're storing them. Keep them in the refrigerator. This is called cold holding. We've got to keep these products below 41 degrees. Now, the way that a refrigerator or a walk-in cooler works is by ambient air. So that's basically saying that cold air has to touch something in order to make it cold. So if you take a number of boxes, cram them all together and shove them in the corner, how is that air going to circulate behind those products and keep them cold all the way around? It's not. So whenever we are putting things into a cooler, make sure that we allow adequate room around these items to allow for air circulation. Um, as I said before, make sure that you're using your thermometers to check your equipment. Okay. How many of you use ice to keep things cold on occasion? Some of you guys? Okay. Ice is just like air. It will only cool what it touches. You can hold your hand above ice, and it's not going to get very cold, but if you stick your hand in ice, it's going to get really cold really quick. So let's look at something very specific here. Um, yeah, we've got this nice bowl of uh, macaroni that we've stuck it right in the ice like an open stack of cold soup. However, it's only submerged about a quarter of the way. I would put money on it that three quarters of this is out of temperature right now. Ice is, is, is a hazard because we get busy, we stick something in ice, we don't really make sure that it's fully submerged, and get busy, you look over three hours later, all the ice is melted. If you're going to use ice, make sure you use it appropriately and refresh the ice regularly. <coughs> make sure that it is, um, it is touching the product that you want it to cool. Pot holding. Uh, this is talking about the use of steam wells and leaving items on the stove <coughs> to be kept hot. Once an item has been fully cooked and then needs to remain hot, it must be kept above 135 degrees. Okay? That's on the opposite end of the spectrum for our temperature danger zone. So, just like ice, just like air, these things will only cool what they touch. So, if you put a big, dense pot of beans into a steam well, it's only going to heat the outside. It's not actually going to penetrate to the center of that, and the center of that is now in the temperature danger zone. So you grab a big scoop of beans, give it to a kid, there's a chance that you just gave that kid food poisoning. So if you're going to be keeping these items hot, make sure that you stir them frequently. Make sure that you cover the items whenever they're not actively being pulled from. And again, I'm going to beat this horse to death. Use your thermometer. Okay, whenever we thaw foods, we have to pay particular attention to a few things. Um, the health department recognizes four ways to safely thaw food. Um, the, my personal favorite, take it out of the freezer, put it in the refrigerator, let it thaw overnight. This is the safest way to do this because the food never breaks into the temperature danger zone. Uh, granted, it may take 24 to 48 hours for that item to thaw. So if you're in a pinch, what I recommend is you thaw it under running water. Cool running water. And it has to remain running. The reason for this is if you just stick something into a vat of hot water and let it sit, you start cooking it from the outside in. So what happens is come back 30 minutes later, the center of that is still frozen, and the outside of it's begun to cook. So if you let that sit long enough, you can see how this can get bad really, really quick. The reason why we have to allow water to run over it is that it breaks the surface tension. Um, bacteria need to be able to adhere to their food. So if you're constantly flowing water over it, it never has the opportunity to attach in the first place. If you absolutely must, 
you may thaw food in the microwave. However, if you're going to thaw food in the microwave, you have to use that product as soon as it comes up. You've got to put it right on the grill, right in the oven. You cannot put something in the microwave to thaw and then put it back in the refrigerator. Because once you put it in the microwave, you begin cooking. You may also thaw items during the cooking process. Uh, you'll see this a lot in McDonald's, uh, Carl's Jr's. Uh, they take a frozen patty, flash fry. They take it straight from a frozen state to a fully cooked state. You can do that if you need to. Um, 10 years ago, uh, it was just kind of accepted that schools did not cook something in bulk cool it and then reheat it the next day. Unfortunately, as of lately, it seems like this is a pretty common practice. This is the most dangerous thing you can do to food for the simple fact that you take an item through the temperature danger zone three times. It gets dangerous very, very quickly. You have to know what you're doing. So if you're going to cool food, there are strict timelines in place. Once something is fully cooked, it must go from 135 degrees to 70 degrees in two hours. That is optimal temperature for bacterial growth. Once you've reached the 70 degree mark, you've got to bring it down to 41 degrees in no more than four hours. So if you have a brisket, for instance, like these guys do here, that large hunk of muscle is not going to cool to the center. So, cut it into slices, smaller pieces, divide that vat of beans into smaller uh, trays, and cool them individually. Um, once they've been cut into smaller pieces, don't stack them together, because then we're back at square one. Use metal pans, because metal conducts heat and cold much better than plastic. And again, allow for adequate airflow around the product. Okay, well, please talk to you this guy. <laughs> what these guys did, they took a large vat of chili that just came off the stove and put it right into the walk-in. What are some problems you guys see with this? <clears throat> exactly, it's not cool fast enough. You're taking a large volume of a dense product and then you put it into uh, a walk-in that holds at about 40 degrees. I'm going to tell them on a place here. I'm not going to tell you who it was. I walked into a barbecue joint in this county, and I took a temperature of a, um, a rack of ribs and a couple of briskets, a couple of pork shoulders that they had cooked 68 hours prior, still at 69 degrees Fahrenheit. They took it directly off the smoker, wrapped it in cellophane, and threw it into a lukewarm walk-in cooler. That's how you kill somebody. Um, we threw away a lot of barbecue that day. Um, so, whenever we're dealing with a large volume of food, which you guys cook for a lot of people every day, that's what we deal with. We've got to divide that up into smaller amounts because smaller amounts cool quicker. Um, if we're using, uh, if we've got something like beans or soups, you can actually add ice directly to that product because whenever you start cooking the beans, you've got to add water anyways. Add ice directly to the center of it. It'll cool from the inside out. Submerge your items in an ice bath. That's the absolute coldest it'll ever get. Uh, you guys know what these are? Cooling wand, stir paddles. Basically, it's a container that you fill with water, freeze, and then stir the product. This cools from the inside out. So, please, please, please do not uh, do this. My little police officer will show you the picture. Okay. So, certain species of food are more at risk for uh, certain bacteria than others. We already talked about chickens and turkeys, things like that. The reason that they're so much more susceptible 
is because um, the way that they're processed. They're all dipped into the same vat and then they're all shipped out. So if one chicken is contaminated, at the very first of the line, I guarantee you everyone from that point on is contaminated also. Uh, the quills of these, uh, these birds puncture all the way into the center of the muscle. So that's why you must, must, must assure that the center of that, uh, the center of that muscle has reached at least 165 degrees. So poultry and stuffed foods, such as stuffed ravioli, must be cooked to 165 degrees. Ground meats must be cooked to 155. Because if you take a steak and then you grind it, you take every bit of bacteria on the outside of that and you fold it in on itself. So every single strain of that meat has been exposed to whatever's on the outside of it. Fish, pork, and other foods must be cooked to 145. Plant foods must be cooked to 135. Steak is the one big outlier here. A whole muscle piece of steak um, can actually be cooked to request. You can eat a rare steak as long as the outside of it has been seared properly. You can do it all day long and be fine. As long as that steak is whole muscle. The minute that you add an injector to the center of that, or if you um, or if you tenderize it with needles, it's now considered a piece of ground meat that has to be cooked to 155 degrees. Okay, so we've talked about cooking things, we've talked about cooling things. Now we're going to talk about the third trip through the danger zone, um, reheating things. Like I said, cooking, cooling, and then reheating is the most dangerous thing that you can do with food. Um, if you're going to reheat something, you have a two hour window to get that food from 41 degrees to 165 degrees. I don't care if it's hamburger, I don't care if it's vegetables, I don't care what it is. If it's been cooked and then cooled, you must reheat it to 165 degrees. Guess what I'm going to ask you to do? Use a thermometer, okay? Use the same thermometer and use the same clock that you started with to assure that you're breathing, reaching that temperature in the appropriate amount of time. Okay. Leftovers may only be reheated one time. You can't keep cooking, cooling, reheating, cooking, cooling, reheating. It gets too dangerous too quick. You cannot do it. <coughs> Make sure that we're using FIFO, first in, first out, which means if you put something in there a week ago and then you put something else in there today, use the week old product first. This assures that you're not going to have food rotting in the walk-in. Make sure that you're rotating your products out. If any item is going to be in your walk-in for more than 24 hours, it must have a date label on it. Okay, as of November of 2011, you may no longer have bare hand contact with ready to eat foods. Now I know that schools are typically, particularly very good at this. Um, most of the time you guys use tongs, use gloves, use a number of things to keep you from handling a ready to eat product. Um, anything that's being ready to eat means it's good to go right then. I don't care if it's going to be cooked like a slice of cheese that you're going to melt over a hamburger patty. If it's ready to eat at that moment, you may not handle it with your bare hands. So, what does this include? This includes pieces of bread, uh, buns, uh, sliced vegetables that may go into a salad, sliced fruits. Anything that is ready to go right then, you cannot touch with your bare hands. Instead, I recommend that you use utensils. <coughs> such as tongs, forks, spoons, things like that. If it's something that absolutely has to be picked up, I recommend you use deli or pastry tissues, just like the people that give you your donuts every day. Take that piece of uh, paper, grab it, give it to whomever, and throw away the piece of paper, don't reuse it. If you absolutely have to, use gloves. 
Gloves are the most abused thing that I ever see in a food establishment. Because people think, I'm wearing gloves, I don't have to wash my hands. I'm sorry, but if you put on clean gloves with dirty hands, you've contaminated those gloves and not doing any good. Don't wash your gloves in the sink. Gloves are cheap. If you soil them, throw them away. If you contaminate them, throw them away. If you rip them, throw them away. They're really cheap, I agree. I catch people washing their gloved hands in the sink. If you're going to use gloves, you must wash your hands before putting them on. Uh, change your gloves as soon as they become soiled or torn. And uh, don't be afraid to change your gloves. Like I said, they're cheap. Better safe than sorry. Here's the one thing I'll say. If you take clean hands, put them in clean gloves, and then contaminate those gloves, if you take those off, you've got to wash your hands before you put on another set of gloves. It's an extra 20 seconds. I know gloves are kind of hard to get on the wet hands. But I'm telling you, you guys are dealing with a very susceptible population to foodborne illness. So take that extra 20 seconds and take that extra uh, precautionary measure because the very last thing you want to do is make the kids sick. If you're going to wear gloves, you must use them correctly. And remember that gloves are absolutely never a substitute for hand washing. Okay, this is the dummy slide. It really bothers me that I have to go over this, but I do, because I see it every single day. Uh, people inadequately washing their hands or just not doing it in the correct fashion to begin with. I actually read a statistic the other day, less than 5% of the surveyed population adequately washed their hands after using a restroom. Mm. Oh, yes it is. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about proper hand washing. First thing, use a designated hand sink. A sink that's dedicated only to washing your hands. Don't be washing your hands in the mall sink because you can contaminate them really quick. Use soap and warm water of at least 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Thoroughly lather your hands for 20 seconds. You say, well, 20 seconds sounds like a long time. Sing to yourself, twinkle, twinkle, little star. Happy birthday. Uh, anything, the ABC song. Anything about 20 seconds that you can sing to yourself. You can start singing to your coworkers, you can have a party. <laughs> Wash all surfaces of your hands, including the backs of your hands, your wrists, between your fingers, and under your fingernails. Rinse your hands adequately because soap, soap on your hands, and then go back to working with food. Soap gives you violent, violent diarrhea really quick. Okay, dry your hands with a paper towel. Don't use a dish towel. Use a paper towel and then dispose of the towel after you have turned off the sink with that paper towel. Why do you turn off the sink with your paper towel? Exactly. You may be doing the right thing. No way to know that your coworkers are doing the right thing. Cover yourself. How many in here would say that you adequately wash your hands to these standards? Show of hands. Okay. We got a little bit of work to do. guys just got these really nice aprons. Maybe not use them to wash to dry your hands. <laughs> Literally everything that you've leaned against, everything that's splashed on that apron has now contaminated that apron. Don't contaminate your hands that you just spent all this time washing with a soiled piece of oil. That's a good looking hand. We've got hot water, cold water, soap, paper towels, Stainless steel and easy to clean piece of equipment. Now you guys know how to use them. Make sure you use the right one. Okay. What is cross contamination? In a very black and white sense, cross contamination is whenever you take the pathogens off of one item or food and put them onto another. Here's a real quick way to do it. We've got raw brisket stored directly above 
you can actually use too little sanitizer, in which case you're not doing anything, and you can definitely use too much. Um, you can actually poison these children by using too much sanitizer. Um, at a certain point, bleach quits dissipating whenever it air dries, and it is toxic. Okay. Once you've washed, rinsed, and then sanitized your dishes, you must allow them to air dry. This is the only way that your sanitizer works. If you stack them all together like this, wet, you just trap moisture in a dark, warm environment for the next several hours. And who knows if there's food in there or not? So where are we going to start growing? Bacteria. Bacteria, exactly. You don't want to take these uh, fresh new meals that we're talking about put them into a petri dish where they can start growing bacteria. Instead, I recommend that you hang out the, the utensils and dishes that you can. If you're not allowed to do that by finding some space or, or equipment, I recommend that you crawl stack. It only takes up about another quarter of an inch uh, per five pans. Um, and it allows for airflow to move through the dishes and allows it to air dry. Okay, when you're sanitizing your work surfaces, go ahead and use those uh, same testing strips because you're using the same chemicals to sanitize your work areas as you are your dishes. Um, again, using too much can be toxic, using not enough, you're wasting your time. Store your wiping cloths in the sanitizer solution. Don't leave the skid marks out. Um, <laughs> Leave that in the sanitizer, burn that, but um, <laughs> leave it in the solution because once it dries, if you've got particles of food in it, you can start growing bacteria if you let it set long enough. Once that chlorine dissipates, you've got a petri dish that you're wiping down your surface. Okay. I would almost guarantee that if you have a chemical in a spray bottle and a wire wrap, that's happened at some point. This is Windex, you can store directly above a ready to eat product, raw onions. I don't care how much you put these onions, you're not going to get rid of that Windex and you're going to poison whomever eats it. I know it's easy, I know it's convenient, do not store your chemicals this way. Do not store your degreaser and Windex next to your tortillas. <laughs> That's an issue. <laughs> Um, it just takes a slide of hand to knock that thing over and contaminate everything on that table. And like I said, you're not going to cook that enough to break down that ammonia. Instead, keep your chemicals stored in a segregated area um, below and away from food. I recommend you put them in a completely separate room in the kitchen. If you're constrained by, um, by the size of your facility, Segregate a single shelf or a single <laughs> group of shelves that are designated only for cleaning items and not food. These items are toxic and uh, they can kill somebody. Keeping with the, the, the stage set for storage, um, make sure that you're storing adequately. Um, in this walk-in, we've allowed enough room for ambient air to surround all of these products. Um, in this dry storage, everything's at least six inches off the ground, as it always should be, and there are no means for potential uh, contamination. This one, however, <laughs> so <laughs> what do you guys think about that one? <laughs> Problem, right? All right, let's find all of them. Okay, first of all, Clorox bleach. Sort of directly above paper plates. That's a problem. We've got uh, food compact surfaces sort of directly on the floor. That's a problem. Every bit of this clutter um, allows for infestation of bugs and rodents. Okay. Um, this cute little guy found him a cupcake. God bless him. <laughs> it is gross. Yeah, he's cute. But let me tell you, gross little thing about mice. Mice are blind. So the only way that they know where they've been and where they haven't is they just trickle a little bit of urine behind them or where they go. 
Don't, don't brush it off just because you saw one roach or just because you saw one mouse. Proactively treat it. Unfortunately, there are some viral uh, gastrointestinal infections, like norovirus, that are capable of going aerosol. Okay? That's why entire cruise ships come down with a stomach flu. It's because someone had norovirus, it went aerosol, and everybody that breathed around that person got sick. So, if you have diarrhea, do not handle food, okay? Okay, so what exactly will it restrict you from handling food? Vomiting, diarrhea, fever, jaundice. You guys know what jaundice is? Yeah. Going yellow. It means that your liver isn't working, okay? Could be hepatitis. Um, if you've ever been diagnosed with head ache, sugar toxin producing E. coli, shigella, Salmonella typhi or norovirus, you must be cleared by a doctor before you come back to work. What, what is Shigella? Shigella is, I'm sorry, what? What is it? Shigella, Shigella is a type of bacteria. What does it make you do? Uh, it's mostly gastrointestinal. Oh, okay. Stay yeah. home. Oh. Basically, if you're sick, stay home. Yeah. <laughs> One other thing. If you have cut yourself, if you burn yourself, if you have a boil or an infected wound, you must be cleared by your manager before you can resume working. If you have it on your hands, wrists, or arms, you can't handle food. It's got to be completely... Okay, if you have a cut, burn, or boil, or infected wound on your hands, or arms, or anything, your face, any exposed area, you must be cleared by your manager before you can go back to work. Okay? It depends. Okay? If it's something that your manager feels that you can adequately um, prevent contamination by bandaging it and then putting a glove over it, okay. However, I'll give you this word of caution. You guys know what Staphylococcus aureus is? Or Versa? Yeah, absolutely. You can ingest that and it can make you sick. It can be spread by food. Okay. Do not drink or eat in the kitchen. Don't smoke in the kitchen. I understand that things get hot. If you absolutely must have a drink in the kitchen, clear with your manager and put it in, at the very least, a cup with a lid and a straw. What I prefer to see, screw bottle caps, okay? Put it, treat it just like bleach, okay? Below and away from food. Don't be putting it on your work areas. If you knock that bad boy over, it's just like you spit all over there. I don't care how bad you try, everybody backwashes. So do not store your drinks with the food that you're preparing. Everybody takes breaks. Everyone goes and eats breakfast or lunch, goes and has a cigarette, whatever. Goes to the restroom. If you do any of these things, you absolutely must wash your hands before you return to work. Absolutely, just do it anyway. Okay, uh, another dummy slide. When to wash your hands? Before doing any food prep, before putting on single-use gloves, after handling raw meats, after handling dirty food containers, after removing soil or contamination on prep surfaces, after eating, drinking, or using tobacco, after using the restroom, after any activity that may have potentially contaminated your hands. If you have a complaint, make it known. If you feel comfortable speaking with your supervisor about it to fix the problem, do it. If you don't, call me. I'll show up. I'll fix it. However, do not make disgruntled complaints or invalid complaints. Just because they fire you, don't tell me that they're cooking meth in the back. <laughs> You'd be surprised what I get called about. If it's a valid complaint, please address it with me. If it is not, please don't. Okay.